There we go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm so glad to see all of you here on this absolutely gorgeous day. It seems so odd for the end of October, but we will enjoy every moment of this lovely weather. My name is Kareen Mogg. I am the director of the Meter Center for Calvin Studies. It is in the Meter Center that you are at this very moment, mm -hmm. and we are delighted to be sponsoring this fall public lecture. Our speaker today is Professor Herman de Vries. He is Professor of Germanic Languages in the World Languages Department at Calvin University, and he holds the Frederick Meyer Chair in Dutch Language and Culture and is currently the president of the American Association for Netherlandic Studies. So he has a lot of things on his plate. Mm -hmm. He began his study, his teaching at Calvin in 1997, the very same year I came. We came the very same year. Following his studies as undergraduate at Calvin College and his graduate work at the University of Cincinnati, where he obtained his PhD in 1996. His published work has focused mostly on aspects of pedagogy, especially how to teach world languages in a North American context. However, his presentation for us today is on something completely different, mm -hmm. seeking wisdom in Benedictine spirituality in the Netherlands and Germany today. Please join me in welcoming Professor de Vries. Thank you, Karine. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to you all for coming out on this beautiful day, as you said. Um, let me begin by acknowledging that it is somewhat strange for me to be talking to you today, to you today about the Benedictines. I'm not Roman Catholic. I'm not an oblate in the Benedictine order. I can say more about oblates later. And I have not yet stayed as a guest in a Benedictine monastery. And yet, I want to talk to you about the Benedictines in the Netherlands and Germany today. Why is that? Well, as a professor of Germanic languages, I try to be a close observer of the cultures of the languages that I teach, Dutch and German. And by virtue of my own interests, I try to pay attention to places in the culture, in these cultures, where spirituality is a topic. And I'm a fan of those places in bookstores and on the internet where we see the intersection of the topics we'll be looking at to today. Uh, today. So I'm trying to make sense of some interesting trends that I've seen in the area of spiritual formation literature or personal transformation literature in the cultures where I dwell in my teaching and learning. At these intersection points, I found that the Benedictines keep showing up. And this has surprised me. This has fascinated me. So today, I'm happy for the opportunity to talk with you about something that's basically a topic of interest for me. The title attempts to capture the phenomenon in a nutshell, seeking wisdom and benedicting spirituality in the Netherlands and Germany today. Well, let's start with some basics. Who are the Benedictines? This seems like a fair question to start with at a Calvinist university in North America. So here's a really short overview. The Order of St. Benedict is, well, maybe I'll advance here. Oh, here we have it. Uh, the Order of St. Benedict is one of the oldest Roman Catholic orders. Uh, the patron St. Benedict lived in Italy from roughly 480 to 550 AD, so roughly a half century after Augustine. Benedict founded monasteries during the Great Migrations after the fall of the Roman Empire. And most famously, and certainly relevant for this talk today, he established what is considered the longest standing rule, commonly referred to as the rule of Benedict. Um, and a little show and tell. So the rule mm -hmm. uh, in Latin, regula, is a, set, uh, a written set of guidelines for the personal and communal living within the monastic order. Benedict's rule is a, is a sh relatively short book, booklet, of 73 short chapters, thematically or topically arranged. Divided into daily readings, Benedictines read through the rule completely three times a year. And probably more accurate to say, they hear it read to them during certain meal times, a total of three times a year. And I got to ask Kareen, I wonder if we have any old rules maybe in the in the collection here, but that's for another another time. So the Order of St. Benedict has around 50 monasteries in Germany. In the Netherlands, there are eight, to my, as far as I can tell, eight active 
uh, monasteries or convents. By contrast, in the United States, there seem to be around 50 total. Mm -hmm. So Benedictine mon monastics are cenobitic, meaning they commit themselves to communal living. They also commit themselves to what's often called the old trias or trias or triad of vows. In Latin, called stabilitas, conversio morum, and obedencia. And I'll say more about these commitments in a, in a moment. The Benedictine order formally recognizes what's called what are called oblates. These are laypersons outside the cloister walls who formally commit to living according to the vows and structure of the Benedictine order to the extent that their lives enable them. While the number of actual monastics and novices is stable or shrinking in Europe, the number of oblates are now growing and they outnumber the number of monastics. Benedictines are also known for their hospitality. They offer lodging to visitors who are then allowed to partake to the degree, to the degree they wish in the daily hours, the uh, five to eight periods of communal prayer, song, and scripture reading. Guests seem to be drawn to the monasteries as places of retreat and restoration. Well, I said before that uh, there was surprising I'm a little ahead of myself. I'll just leave that up there. Uh, surprising interest in the Benedictines today. Well, why do I say surprising? Well, the Netherlands, like all of Europe, uh, has seen dramatic decline in the role that the church plays in society. This is not news to us. And in modern cultures addicted to novelty, how could a monastic order 1,500 years old possibly be appealing? Mm -hmm. And yet this order of St. Benedict persists. The guest houses are full with waiting lists besides. Readers are buying books by authors who are translating Benedictine wisdom into modern day contexts. There is a related niche of spokespersons for the Benedictine way on the internet, various places, YouTube, and prominent Benedictines find themselves on talk shows and podcasts, even in spaces uh, which are normally of a Protestant bent. I've even found references to Benedictine thought in church newsletters, which are available on the Protestant Church of the Netherlands website. Am I suggesting that the interest in Benedict Benedictine thought is mainstream in Dutch and German culture? No, but it is remarkably present in the conversations around and the literature on spirituality and spiritual formation. So let's meet some of the people who are popularizing Benedict Benedictine thought. The most prominent public figure of the German Benedictines is a German pater or padre, a monk, named Anselm Grün. We have some. Um, from the monastery in Münster Schwarzach, in Bavaria, that's near Würzburg. Anselm Grün has been called the best selling German author of spiritual literature living today. A little some more detail about him. By some counts, he's published over 300 titles. And before his retirement, nearly 10 years ago, he was delivering 200 public lectures a year and was a frequent interviewee on German radio programs and talk shows. A lot of those you can find on, on uh, YouTube. He continues these things, though scaled back today. This is a rare thing for a monk in an order that's known for its stabilitas or staying in one place. Even now at age 79, he continues to publish either in the Münster Schwarzach Monastery Press or in the more mainstream publisher, the Herder Verlag. Now I must admit that while I was, anyway, time out, I'm gonna show you some more, uh, just to illustrate a little bit of the popularity. This is a bookstore in, um, in Amsterdam, Skeltema, where I was a few years ago. This is the entirety of the, the enormous bookstores section on spiritual spirituality literature from all traditions mm -hmm. around the world. And then in that shelf, uh, there was an entire shelf devoted alone to Anselm Grün. Mm -hmm. So you can see how well he sells, how popular the author is. Oh yeah, I'm gonna give you just a few, few titles so you can see. Um, there's one, Quellen Innerer Kraft, so sources of inner strength, avoiding exhaustion, using positive energy, 
and and I buy his books in Dutch or in German. I, I can't remember what I, which language I read them in because they're always immediately translated into Dutch. It seems to be when they come out. This one, Rust en Regelmaat, what you can learn from living in a cloister, what you can learn from living in a cloister in a monastery. Mm -hmm. Rust en Regelmaat. There's lots of different ways you could probably translate that. I'm going to come back to that later. Something like probably rest and order. Um, this was a very popular book, Menschen führen, Leben wecken. So leading people, awakening life. And this one I got in Dutch, was originally German, Zeit von je Leben. So time of your life, going uh, dealing with a precious commodity, time. So uh, I was a little bit uh, second guessing myself whether or not you know, how relevant Grün still is. Is he still talked about? Is he still recognized? Because he, he's been retired for a number of years. And then, lo and behold, oh, sorry, time out here, a little bit more. I had a few more, uh, mm -hmm. a few more examples of his presence. This, these are screenshots from YouTube. And um, he was quite doing a sort of circuit for a while after that third to last, that third book I showed. Uh, speaking and for various companies and firms and um, conferences on management and leadership. And just this last week, so I was wondering, you know, how relevant is, and just this last week, you can see the date there is October 18 mm -hmm. this year. Uh, he was just granted a pretty significant award uh, from the Vatican Per Artem Adeum, which Franz can correct me if I'm wrong, I guess, for the arts, uh, so for, to God. And uh, with his more than 300 books, the Benedictine Pater Anselm Grün is considered one of the most successful German authors for religious books. And he is awarded for this, uh, this writing accomplishment. Mm -hmm. So a very significant uh, recognition of his uh, life's work just from two weeks ago. And here's a little detail of the uh, announcement that came out about that. And I'll just zoom in on one part of the text here. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, we can even hear, so air. So after the Reichtum, so he um, he brings across the riches of the Christian message to people who are searching for spirituality, mm -hmm. and uh, offers a new perspective on classic religious topics or themes. His works help people not only to understand Christianity, but they also uh, stimulate to a deeper reflection about the meaning of life of faith. And the position of or the of people in the world, mm -hmm. so quite a uh, quite a remarkable recognition. Just uh, very very recently for Anselm Grün. Okay, so now we're going to talk about another person, and this person is uh, from the Netherlands. Once he's a similar phenomenon, albeit on a smaller scale, in the year two thousand, Bill Derksen and Oblate in the order and a professor of philosophy at the University of Nijmegen, published a book called En Lebensregel for Beginners, A Little Rule or a Rule for Beginners. This book is subtitled, as you can see, Benedictine Spirituality for Daily Life. And it's still in print 25 years later. This was, interestingly, uh, one of the very few books of this whole genre that's been translated into English. Almost nothing by Grün has been, a, a, few, a few titles. And, uh, and this book by Derks was translated by a small college press, uh, I think, in uh, Minnesota. Um, it was a, it uh, has received little notice in the Anglo world. By contrast, Derks's Lebensregel, this book, was a bestseller in the Netherlands in its, in its genre, and for a time, it was even in the top 10 selling uh, category of management literature, <laughs> interestingly. He wrote a follow-up book to this rule for beginners titled The Blessed Life. And just fairly recently, um, uh, two years ago, 
uh, came out with this book. A um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a fun title to read. I should ask my students to help me here. Benedictines of Sturmanskunst. So helmsmanship, Benedictine helms, helmsmanship, leadership and service of community. <clears throat> This is a this is a much more academic book, sort of unpacking a lot of the topics that came up in the earlier book, which was more popular. So Anselm Grün and Will Derricks are the two most important resources for my talk today. But I want to mention two others. Martina Funk, the writings of Martina Funk, a Christian social scientist, columnist, and lecturer at Saxion University, and former chair of the nature organization Roche. One finds frequent mention of the Benedictines. In her book, Sustainability and Quality of Life, it's, okay, just, uh, yeah, there you go. it's coming back. Cool. Uh, Funk examines worldviews and values of four communities to discern their environmental impact and approach to creation care. One of these communities is the Benedictines, where she spent considerable time as a guest and a volunteer in Benedictine farms and gardens. Funk concludes that we can learn from how the Benedictines approach the creation and the mindset of sustainability that stems from many of their core convictions and ways of living. A person that I've only very recently discovered, I'll admit, is the Benedictine monastic Thomas Quartier. And this German citizen lives in a Belgian monastery, but has a, prof a professor's position at the University of Nijmegen. <laughs> In 2022, he was chosen Theolog des Vaterlands, uh, the Elogian of the Netherlands, the Fatherland. For the first time ever, a Benedictine monk was chosen for this annual designation, which is decided by a jury drawn from religiously affiliated newspapers, broadcasters, and academics from theology departments at various universities. Bartir is a sought-after guest on talk shows and podcasts. He's a prolific scholar who also writes popular as well as academic books. <clears throat> the announcement of Quartier's award as theologian of the Netherlands read, quote, the jury is amazed at how Thomas Quartier, not only in his role as academic theologian, but also as a monastic, has brought attention to the value and beauty of the monastic life in the Netherlands and how he relates it to current topics, topics in society, end quote. Quartier has become a kind of public figure since receiving his title, Theolog des Vaterlands. He did over 100 interviews that year and garnered a lot of attention by asking provocative questions, especially about the immigrant situation in the Netherlands, taking a very Benedictine stand that one must welcome the stranger knocking at your door. Now, I confess that I only became aware of Quartier uh, after I agreed to do this talk, <laughs> I have not yet been able to really digest his writings, and I look forward to doing so. Uh, we'll see what comes of that. I did order a swath of his books for Heckman Library. Hopefully, they'll be award, uh, uh, arriving soon and be cataloged. And uh, so keep an eye out for those if you're interested yourself. Okay. So... <clears throat> Translating the Benedictine life, translating Benedictine ways to life outside the cloister walls. People see in certain aspects of the Benedictine way of life answers some of our struggles in our modern world. There is a kind of call of ancient wisdom that people seem to encounter when they spend time in Benedictine communities or when they delve into their writings. For various reasons, Benedictine spirituality or even Benedictine worldview translates well into life outside the cloister walls. Let's unpack some of these themes and details of Benedictine life a bit more in order to understand the appeal. What is the essence of the Benedictine, of Benedictine spirituality as explained in the resources that I've showed you? A common approach uh, that these translators of the Benedictine way take is to begin with the three foundational vows of the Benedictines. So these are somewhat unique to the Benedictines. They of course, have the other vows that all orders have of, of poverty, chastity, and so forth. But these three are particularly Benedictine and Trappist and Cistercian. Uh, Stabilitas obedentia conversio morum. And I'll mention them here briefly, define them briefly, and then show how they are understood today and also what possible parallels outside the cloister walls might be seen.
So stabilitas, constancy would be one translation of that. And I'm putting some Dutch words on here also for the sake of my students who are here. Thank you for coming. You can see some of these. The Dutch would be bestendigheid. would be one way to say that. Often referred to also as stabilitas loci or loci. So stabilitas in place. Originally, Benedict was wary of the wandering monastics of his time. He insisted that members of his communal order made a commitment to stay put. Commitment for today's times. Dierksa suggests that this means sticking with your community and not running away from the situation that you have chosen. I think I have some more detail here for you. Yeah. Not running away from the situation that you have chosen. The Dutch, full howden, persistence. Quote, even when it appears that things won't turn out well. Words like fidelity are used. Trouw. It's a Dutch word. It's about growing and blossoming where you are planted. In this situation, in this family, in this organization where you have given your yes to and not to someplace else. That's a quote from Dirksen. How to apply this? Well, Dirksa says, in every context, you can practice being there in a small act of faithfulness to what this moment requires of you in a telephone call, in your work, and I'm quoting here from this book, in a work, in your work as a mechanic on a Boeing 747, in preparing a meal for your family, in patching a bicycle tire. It's a Dutch book. For all these matters, the truth applies that things flourish through our attention, and then we flourish too. One cannot help but notice here that the emphasis on attention and paying attention, that this is echoed in other spiritual traditions. For example, the um, I think here of the, of the Buddhist poet mm -hmm. and uh, peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh, or even the popularity of um, the mindfulness movement in uh, positive psychology. Conversio morum, literally conversion of behavior. Now, of course, as Christian monastics, Benedictines are concerned with holy living. Their approach, however, is not ascetic heroics, but daily improvements. Dirksa grabs here an English language phrase when discussing this, and he says it's about turnaround management, but then on a very modest micro level, namely that of yourself. In place of the unattainable, everything has to a change approach in life, the Benedictine vow of conversio morum corresponds in some ways to the thought of the Stoic philosophers. Work on small, achievable things, say the Benedictines. Make these small betterments a habit. And one here cannot help but notice overlap with other uh, concepts in our culture that we hear of. I'm thinking here of the, um, I'm thinking here of the Japanese a notion of Kaizen, uh, which has been borrowed from Japanese manufacturing, applied to positive psychology. And you see this even in self-help literature when you're in the airports, <laughs> James, Clear's, James Clear's Atomic Habits or the psychologist Robert Maurer's One Small Step. So these are modern ideas in our airport book stores, but the Benedictines have been talking about them for 1500 years. <laughs> Obedencia, obedencia. So it looks a lot like the word obedience, right? Um, for the Benedictines, it has everything to do with listening. In fact, that's the first word of the entire rule. Ausculata, I think it is in Latin. That's sort of related to the root word of stethoscope as well. So deep listening. This is super embedded in Benedictine culture, according to these works. The idea of close listening it comes from uh ob adire, audire so that's an intensification of audire which is to hear or listen so it's extra intense listening and what's fun is to look at the dutch word there so you know to to obey is or obedience is gehoorzaamheid well horen is in that word too so it's a nice it's really fun when you start uh teasing the etymologies of these words and you get a, a deeper understanding the dutch or the dutch or the benedictines use the phrase listening from the heart a lot quoting derksa again it's allowing yourself to be told what to do wanting to listen to another person's advice the oh so difficult letting go of your own stubbornness the dutch word 
eigenweisheit, your own, your own wisdom. <laughs> Hearing a lot of comments about that one. I wonder if you heard when you were younger, eigenweis, right? Yeah. <laughs> Obedience is first an, an internal positive response. Giving a response often goes hand in hand with losing and finding yourself at the same time. End quote from Derek Sib. Nice application by uh, Derksa. He says, uh, what can this mean for us today? He says, you can ask yourself at the end of the day, was I alert to situations that required my response? Was I really listening to my kids? Do I hear their unspoken needs? Am I really, here's, he's a professor, so he has some nice uh, anecdotes from the classroom. Am I really listening to students when they ask a question rather than just thinking about what my next brilliant comment will be. So that's obedencia for the Benedictines. So this uh, triad of vows are far foundational for the Benedictines. According to this literature, they do not see them as restrictive or punitive. They understand these commitments as life giving and in life improving. They embrace these attitudes and approaches as one that leads to a flourishing life. And laypersons like us sense in them translatable truths. That commitment to where we are planted is good. That change in our lives little by little is attainable. That deep listening from the heart will improve our lives and the lives and relationships wherever we're at. Let's talk a bit about spirituality. It is said that the Benedictine spirituality is an earth, earthly or earthy, probably a better way, earthy spirituality. It's not interested in escaping the world, but in how to live in the world. Let's unpack some aspects of Benedictine spirituality as they are presented in these various works and how they are conveyed to the either Dutch or German readers who are consuming these materials. What are some key features of the Benedictine way? Okay, we'll start. I actually was going to start with Ora et Labora, so I'm just going to read that. Maybe I accidentally did, deleted that slide. Ora et Labora. Let's start with that short Latin phrase that is probably the most, most people associate with the Benedictines. Ora et Labora, pray and work. One naturally expects any monastic community to stress prayer, but the essentially equal emphasis on work for the Benedictines is striking. The rule gives great attention to the role of work in the monastic's day. And the Benedictines give great attention to their, to their approach to work, and they value the work itself. And yet, given the structured nature of their days and the constant balancing of their energies in the multitudes of psalm and prayer time, the ora of ora et labora, they achieve a balance and maintain an equanimity that observers notice. This sense of balance is both nourishing to those within the community and it's also attractive to those outside. Next one, Uts in omnibus purificatur Deus, that in all things God may be glorified. And this is a central motto in Benedict's rule. The upshot of this internalized manner is that the followers of the rule try to do everything with attentiveness and care. Benedict's injunction has led to a culture of excellence and beauty amongst the monastics in this tradition. It is no surprise that the Benedictines have cultivated the arts and, the, and, uh, and artists. The architecture and aesthetics of their monasteries displays, displays a simple beauty, a durability, and exquisite craftsmanship. It is said that a Benedictine will be observed exerting the same care and precision, whether writing a homily or sweeping a floor or arranging flowers in a vase or tending to any other chore. The omnibus in all things, every activity of life to the glory of God. Well, there was the Ora Labora and you heard my description of that. Uh, we'll move on to the next one, and that is structure. Structure. Benedict himself had a deep antipathy to idleness. 
Anselm Grün comments that for Benedict, God is a God of order, not chaos. So this is uh, one of the books that deals with that quite a bit. Uh, it's originally in German. You can, it's fun to look at the titles. So the original German, Klarheit, Ordnung, Stille. So Klarheit, Clarity, Ordnung, Order, right? Stille, Silence, right? Yeah, this was co-authored by a, by a uh, journalist who was trying to translate what we can learn about life from, in, a, in a cloister, in a monastery. The Dutch, as I said before, Rust en Regelmaat, clearly the translator chose that title because of the alliteration. Mm -hmm. Sounds nice. Um, you also see the word sort of regularity in Regelmaat, mm -hmm. right? Rust, uh, it can be rest, but it can also be calm. And so these, all these ideas are embedded in, a, in the idea of structure or part of a Benedictine understanding of structure. The task of God's creatures is to participate in the continuous divine direction away from chaos toward order and the blessings that order brings. This is immediately apparent in the unfolding of the Benedictine day which is a careful orchestration of the hours, the moments of prayer, between which there is time for work, recreation, reading, food, and more. So there's a time for everything, but it's structured time. So it's, it's the, we're known for the hours, these five to eight, depending on which, word, which community they're in, uh, moments of prayer where they go to the chapel to pray and so forth. But then in between those moments, it's also very structured time, time for the things I mentioned. Structure. Hugely, hugely important for the Benedictines. Let's talk about some virtues. Benedictine spiritual spirituality also means a cultivation of virtues. The chief virtues for Benedictine are arguably uh, humility, moderation, and hospitality. The rule speaks often of these virtues as do also the modern day translators of these rules, of the rule for us. Humility. <clears throat> Anselm Grün knows his classical language as well. He often begins an exploration of concepts with a dive into etymology. Humilitas comes from hum humus, mm -hmm. right? Uh, meaning earth. Humility means standing on the earth with both feet, accepting your humanity, not putting yourself above others, respecting others, respecting creation, respecting products from creation and things crafted for our use. A cultivated humbleness was for Benedict not only a theological reality before Almighty God, it was also a necessary posture to ward off discord in the community. And egalitarianism reigns amongst the Benedictines, where they all take their turns, for example, on kitchen duty. No one is above the menial tasks. Humility also informs the care that Benedictines give to the goods of the monastery. In the rule, Benedict is so particular as to give instructions as to how the members of the community are to take care of the utensils in the kitchen and the tools in the monastery. Moderation. Benedict was clearly influenced by the classical virtues of the Greeks and the Romans. Aristotle championed moderation as one of the moral virtues. While the Benedictines, like other orders, insist on common possession, the Benedictines are not monastics of austerity. Benedictines, like Augustine, have a deep affirmation of creation and its goodness. They will not shun but enjoy fruits of creation, such as arts, music, the sciences, mathematics, craftsmanship, food, wine. However, in all these things, they stress moderation. The virtue of moderation goes hand in hand for Benedicts, for Benedictines with the constant striving for balance in all things. Oh yeah, I wanted to put these Dutch words here in German words. So humility, one of the Dutch words for humility might be nederheid, so neder, keeping yourself low, low to the earth, to the ground. Uh, in German, demut, and the moderation, metmate, and German, in massen. So uh, having to deal with, actually, those words suggest the English equivalent of uh, measure, 
Mm -hmm. Right? So moderation is about measuring carefully your needs mm -hmm. and your energy and what you do with who you are and 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 having that in the right measure. So I guess the, I like how the Dutch and German words suggest more the idea of measure than does the word moderation, at least in my ears. All right, where were we at? Hospitality, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in Dutch, Gastfreiheit. In German, Gastfreundlichkeit. Um, that's also really interesting, isn't it? How for the Dutch, it's about the freedom of the guest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess, and, and in German, it's more friendliness. Mm -hmm. The guest is a friend. You can, you can spend all day doing these things, right? Mm -hmm. It's so fun. This is why we learn foreign languages, people, right? All right. The, the saying that one reads over and over again in, in this literature is, what, and it comes directly out of the rule, welcome every guest as if they were Christ themselves. This spirit draws from the deep Benedictine sense of humility, and it animates not only their tradition of guest houses and retreat centers, but also their out support, outspoken support for welcoming strangers and refugees. All right, moving on. Benedictine time. I'm losing, my, <laughs> losing my voice a little bit here. So. This topic comes up over and over again. The Benedictine approach to time seems to have particular appeal to visitors and observers from outside the cloister walls. What is it about Benedictine time? Well, here's a glimpse as conveyed by these writers. Time is a gift and it's understood as the space and the medium in which we get to live out our lives. Benedictines therefore take a very positive, affirming approach to time. There is a deep awareness of time as liturgical time. Therefore, what is presented and called for in the liturgical calendar gives meaning and also life-giving variety over the span of a year. Close observation of the liturgical calendar cultivates a kind of realism for the human experience. The fasting of Lent enhances the festive joy of Eastertide. Benedictine rhythms of time internalize the human reality that a time of restraint enhances a time of enjoyment. So the anticipation, for example, of in Advent mm -hmm. gives all the more celebration to the incarnation, mm -hmm. Christ among us. So um, it's never too late for us to tune in to the liturgical calendar, even in our context here. Uh, as Protestant Calvinists. <laughs> Anselm Grün explains over and again that the Benedictines understand the difference that the Greeks understood between Kronos and Kairos. So the other writers that I mentioned, for example, Martina Funk and Derksa dwell on these topics very much in their appraisal of Benedictine time. Kronos, to review, is clock time. It's ticking time and it marches unwaveringly forward, devouring minutes, hours, days, and years. Kairos, by contrast, is experience time. It's lived time. It's time that, as we all have experienced at some point, sometimes suspended time, right? Time that's unconcerned with minutes and hours. It's somewhat akin to flow, so that concept introduced to us by positive psychology about 40, 50 years ago. So Kronos and Kairos, they're very, they, they, it's, they're very aware of both, right? In order to have the, the, the bell ring for the prayer moments and so forth, they have to be locked into chronological time. But uh, it's really, I think for the Benedictines, from what I can tell, uh, it's Kronos in service of Kairos. Yeah. All right. Anselm Grün writes in his book, Time of Your Life, I had the, the cover up there a moment ago. He writes that time is not something to be used, but to be lived in. He advises readers not to try to copy the rhythms of the monastery with the strict hours of prayer. We, we could never do that really outside of that context. But yet to find an analogous way to live into the right rhythms of time and thus to flourish. I'll read a longer quote from him here in English. Uh, the right way 
to live is to trace the inner rhythm of your own body and of the whole cosmos and to orient yourself to that. Then we are healthy in harmony with ourselves and in accord with our true selves. If you devote yourself to the rhythm of time, you don't experience it as a tyrant whom you must slavishly serve, but as a gift that is of service to you. It causes you to experience time as a space where you are at home. It's worth pondering for a bit. So Benedictines are deeply in tune with what they consider the curative healing rhythms of time itself. All right, moving toward the end here. A, uh, in the rule for beginners from Derkse, the Dutch philosopher, who I'm quoting quite a bit here, he presents a final chapter in his best-selling book uh, with the fetching title, Benedictine's Tight Management. I don't really need to translate that, do I? The subtitle is interesting. And gefulde agenda, maar nooit druk, which translates to something like, your calendar planner is full, but you're never too busy. Wow. All right. This seeming paradox is made possible by the Benedictines' understanding of life and days in this holy rhythm that we're talking about. Derksa further suggests that three Benedictine art forms emerge here, primarily from principles derived from the vow that we unpacked earlier, uh, the vow of obedencia, that of listening and responding. So these three arts that, ben, that Derksa suggests, they are the art of beginning, the art of stopping, and the art of relaxed dignity between beginning and stopping. <laughs> and the Dutch there, the kunst van het beginnen, the kunst van het ophouden, and the kunst van het van de ontspannen waardigheid tussen beginnen en ophouden. Ophouden might be, you could translate that as quitting too, but I, I like stopping better. All right, let me talk about those briefly. The art of beginning. Benedict emphasizes over and over again that in the rule, there should be, in, in the rule that there should be as little time as possible between call and response. For example, when the bell rings for prayer, monastics are to immediately lay down whatever tool is in their hand and quote, hasten to the chapel. So this Benedictine reflex cultivates the art of beginning. And this habit can help us confront the human experience that beginnings can be hard, especially those things we'd rather put off until we feel like it. The art of stopping. In order to begin the next planned or scheduled moment of your day with the right disposition, you must be able to stop what you are doing at the scheduled time, even when you feel like carrying on. This Benedictine reflex not only emerges from the order's commitment to moderation, but also to the internalized notion that humans thrive with healthy, healthy alternation and sequencing of differing tasks. There's a strong sense of that in the rule. A Benedictine will have a natural aversion or even a revulsion at the notion of multitasking. It would go against the grain of their commitment to attentiveness to what you are called to do at the moment. But they are very good at quickly switching to their next task without delay and then being fully present in that moment. Will Derksa gives an illustration to underline this capacity. And this illustration that he gives is so thoroughly Dutch in context that I must cite it here. He discusses how, say, after a very difficult faculty meeting at the end of the day, it is very healing and refreshing to turn your, turn your attention uh, completely now to the commute home. Um, and so here's a quote from him. Benedictine stopping means allowing yourself to let it completely sink in that, quote, now I'm on my bicycle. Mm -hmm. Now I'm riding home through this beautiful boulder. Were that all our commutes were like that, but mm -hmm. to be able to focus completely on that moment and forget about that awful faculty meeting that you just left 15 minutes ago. And then finally, the art of relaxed dignity between beginning and stopping. Anselm Grün writes that, quote, spiritual living means attentive and intentional living, end quote. Benedictine stressed the idea of attention, giving full attention to the moment, and whatever you're doing, be it work or recreation. This is the art of doing between the starting and the stopping, not only with focused attention, but also, also with a calm acceptance of what that activity entails. So Dierksa stresses that the idea is not even to focus on getting things done, but just to do something well. 
It is to do everything with dignity. And the Dutch uh, word for uh, uh, here would be met waardigheid, or the German met würde. So those two words have value built into them. And, and this refers to any activity whatsoever. So a phrase that I've received, I have seen repeated over and again in this literature is, quote, the same attitude or approach in your recreation time as in the chapel, end quote. There's no hierarchy of, of value here, no hierarchy of dignity. Bring the same attentiveness to sweeping the floor as to writing the keynote lecture. Benedict stresses such an attitudinal approach to work in his rule, where he's also fond of reminding the brothers and sisters not to complain about the work set before them, even when it seems particularly difficult. That's a topic I didn't put on here, but also the Benedict is obsessed with telling the monastics not to murmur, mm -hmm. not to complain. Mm -hmm. It's a grave sin. I'm trying to remember that. <laughs> Derek just summarizes the overall approach to time, saying, a life with a beneficial curative healing rhythm in Leven mit Heilsam Ritzme. He says that Benedictine time can translate outside the cloister walls. One has to find the fitting rhythm and then develop a fitting schedule in order or an order to your day. And this should ideally feature a fixed pattern that allows for the rhythm of exertion and relaxation. So the spiritual inhaling and spiritual exhaling. That, that rhythm is super important. This way of moving through our days, honoring the gift, the seasons, and the rhythms of time is how Benedictines understand time to be life-giving rather than life-draining. Okay, the last major topic that I'll raise here, and I won't go into detail, uh, is maybe what might be called Benedictine-style leadership. I can only give a brief overview, and to do this topic, justice would really require part two to this talk but there seems to be an appetite for learning about the art or skill of leadership from the Benedictine tradition. I referenced earlier two hefty books on the subject, Grün's Menschen führen Leben wecken and Dirks' uh, Benedictine uh, Helmsmanship. Mm -hmm. Dirks also devoted three chapters to the Benedictine leadership style in his Rule for Beginners, which probably explains how it landed on the top 10 list for management literature in the Netherlands. Green has also given many lectures and keynotes for businesses and organization. how is the, organizations. How is this possible? The answer is because Benedict himself devotes sections of his rule to the office of the abbot and to that of the cellarer. Benedict was acutely aware of the need to define these leadership roles within the monastic communities. He had an acute sense of the need for structure, order, guidelines, and leadership for these communities to flourish. Therefore, the attention, especially on the abbot, the top dog, the CEO, one might say. The cellarer, one could say, is the top manager, the one in charge of plant operations and its employees. These are not insignificant functions even today. Benedictine communities own significant property and buildings. They have small farms, gardens, even, uh, and even as is the case with Münster Schwarzach in Bavaria, um, a community with 100 monastics. They employ 300 people from the area for operations on their property, such as a retreat center, gift shop, vineyard, publishing company, printing press, and more. So many Benedictine communities run guest houses, and retreat centers, and therefore cater to regular short-term guests. Some monastic communities partner with area schools for education and the arts as well. So I cannot speak to whether the Benedictine leadership models has translated directly to financial success of businesses. Perhaps that's a, a topic for someone to study, but it does seem to be a tenable assertion to say that one can learn something from the Benedictines about how an organization can be productive, organized and serviced by contented workers and personnel. As Martina Funk summarizes, quote, Benedictine management is not focused on maximization of profits, but above all on development and well-being of people. Benedict is most concerned about this in his rule. His approach to simplify greatly is to focus on the character, the virtues, and the qualities of the leader first. These leaders in turn must invest themselves in the growth of their employees, each according to their abilities and needs. Now to unpa unpack all this in would entail going beyond the scope of this talk, but perhaps it intrigues you to dive further into it yourself. In conclusion, 
What can be said about the presence of the Benedictine literature and personalities in the world of spiritual formation resources? Benedictine thought is received by pockets of the population in Germany and the Netherlands as modern day wisdom literature. Mm -hmm. People of all times, it seems, want answers to the question of how do we live our lives? And I, I wanna make an aside here um, and that um, to say that the appeal of this question, I think to Protestant and reform types like myself, maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, uh, is, is, is great because we put so much energy into very different questions. We, we, we ask the question, what shall we believe, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and for better or for worse, we take such a, this is my opinion, we take a very cognitive approach to our faith lives, to our lives before God. And perhaps all Roman Catholics, but certainly the Benedictines, are, paying, are, are playing different chords in the music of their lives. They're invested in how to live in our creaturely state on this earth, in our human selves, with all our capacities and limitations. I find it rather refreshing to learn from them, mm -hmm. from those questions. Why the receptivity in German lands? Well, perhaps there is an appreciation there still of old but durable things. A community that carries on after 1500 years must know something good. In our fast paced 24 seven world, people are longing for calm and for structure, for another way to inhabit time to borrow uh, the subtitle or to borrow the title from Jamie Smith's uh, recent book, How to Inhabit Time. The Benedictines know and appreciate work, but they do not let it dominate their lives. The rule ensures them a structure that balances the active and the reflective life. So those are a few reasons for those outside the cloister walls to be looking to the Benedictines for wisdom. If these topics pique your interest, you're going to have to brush up on your German or Dutch to read most of what Anselm Grün, Will Derkse, Martina Funk, or Thomas Quartier have to say. But Derkse's, Derkse's Little Rule for Beginners is available in English. Our library actually has a copy. Um, I'll return it at some point so you can check that out. Um, maybe you can get it via Amazon or something as well. Uh, a couple places, and this is how I'll conclude, uh, where you want to, if you want to dive in further in English, I can re recommend a few names. Uh, David Steindl Rust, a German Benedictine who has lived in the United States and has written in English. Uh, he also, he's 98 years old, still going strong, apparently. He has a fascinating talk on YouTube on gratitude. He's called, the, he's known as the gratitude monk. Highly, highly recommend it. You can also read Kathleen Norris's uh, book from about 20 years ago, A Cloister Walk. I also recommend the American monast the Benedictine monastic Joan Chittister. Uh, she's a prolific writer and columnist with an uh, online presence as well. And you can go to the rule itself um, and read Philip Lawrence's commentary um, on this website, ChristDesert.org. And he does a fantastic job of um, making the rule um, relatable and relevant for today. Those are all English language resources. If you'd like, I'll conclude by saying, bedankt, schönen Dank. <laughs> Thank you, Herman. I hope you'll be happy to answer a sure. few, few questions. Try. Um, I'll just start by asking, are you aware of conversations in Germany or in the Netherlands between the Benedictines and reformed Christians? Yeah. Like, is there is there an ecumenical conversation or yeah. is it all kind of just the Benedictines are doing their thing? Yeah, that's a great question. I'd like to find the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I can tell you this, my first encounter with them was was probably the book by Derksa, and it was given to me by a, a, a Calvinist pastor okay. who said, hey, Herm, I think you might enjoy this book. Mm -hmm. So, and I noticed, you know, just asking around that uh, Protestants seem to be aware of, of this literature. Those who, those who are interested in spiritual formation literature seem to be quite aware of it, mm -hmm. but to, to what degree there, well, there's a great podcast um, if you can, if you understand Dutch, it's a fantastic podcast by the evangelical broadcast company called the, um, the Ongelovelijke mm -hmm. podcast. 
and it's predominantly Protestant, but they've had this Thomas Quartier on there as a guest. Mm -hmm. So I think when uh, when he became theologian of the of the fatherland, so to speak, then Protestants paid attention. So yeah, yeah that I I'd love to find that out. You know, on what level there's more ecumenical co conversation. Yeah, because uh, it's important topics for everybody. Yeah, I absolutely, think, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, I think we're in an era too where certainly in the Netherlands, you know, the, the whole Protestant church is really a conglomeration of former yep. denominations. This idea, you know, they're open to ecumenical conversation, maybe in a way that we're not quite yet here. Yep. So they're ahead of us, I think, with that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions from the group, things you want to ask about, things that piqued your interest as Professor DeVries talked about them. Questions, comments. Go ahead, Irene. So leadership, that jumped out at me. Why in a corporation, for example, how could Benedictine thinking be helpful uh, to teach leadership in a corporation? It's, yeah, right. I think some, yeah, it's probably a slice only of corporate, let's say America, that are interested in leadership ethics, right? And German Wirtschaftsethik. And, you know, I've seen, for example, Derksa has written about uh, Patagonia, for example, is a company that clearly has made a decision to the extent I'm aware, you know, to, to be uh, sort of outside the mainstream in terms of it, if its ethics of sustainability and taking care of its employees going above and beyond what the American or the or the modern standards would be, you know, to raise the threshold in terms of ethical behavior. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a. Yeah, it's an ethical stance that sort of it trumps. Or, sorry, uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, prioritizes a, a prioritizes a higher a higher order than profit, for example, right? So I do I do think there's an awareness of that in, in slices of corporate world. It's not my that's not my uh, that's not where I dwell, but I'm fascinated by that. So, yeah. Other yep. questions? Yes, Otto. I can see a lot of this in you. Uh, <laughs> you really? But no, no, but in the sense of things that you, you want to look towards, right? Yeah. In terms of using time. Yeah. Uh, what what things have you felt you have taken on or, or want to take on? Yeah. Yeah. I thought you were going to say you recognized me um, when I was talking about structure, uh, uh, but uh, in an ironic way. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, no, these are things. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I'm fascinated by these topics, partly because these are things I want to internalize better. Right. Um, well, the question was what. Well, what interests you the most? Yeah, yeah. I, I like this idea of um, how to. Um, I, I want to figure out how to better to live into the the right rhythms of time. See time. It's so easy to see time as chronos. This is devouring you, right? I mean, I think the Greek mythology, right? Chronos literally devoured his or her children, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do we escape that? How do we how do we embrace time as a gift and so forth? So um, it requires it requires discipline. And the, and the Benedictines, of course, have to have that. I mean, I'll, I didn't talk about that much, but if you're in a, living in a monastic order, you have to have discipline and follow rules that you you agree with so um i think they're on to something they've been on to something for 1500 years about the sort of holy rhythms of time that it's our job as creatures to live into and so we need to uh learn from the the, the wisdom literature that tells us how to do that mm -hmm. that answers your question mm -hmm. you know that's a, and I, I like particularly the sense of something i've been working towards of focusing on one thing getting it done and then when it's time to stop, stop. Yeah. I'm still not good at it, but yeah. fine. It has made a difference. I think, you, you know, all monastic traditions have that strength, right? Um, I mean, I'm, Thomas, Thomas Merton, for example, he was fascinated with Eastern monasticism, right? He wrote several books about it, and, and he talks a lot about that, too. You know, this idea of, of attentiveness is somehow part of all monastic traditions. They recognize there's some deep, deep good in that kind of focus it's it's life-giving yeah go ahead denise yeah so um i have a more or less a comment perhaps um i'm curious about uh listening from the heart mm -hmm. 
that that this sounds so intriguing to me. However, I think there is a resistance in this country in terms of actually applying that, doing it, practicing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, where where do you think that resistance comes from? I don't know. Mm -hmm. We're distracted. Mm -hmm. I think that's one, you know, right? I mean, it's that's the modern day uh, 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 malady. Yeah, uh, I wish I had more to say about that. That listening from the heart, how to unpack that? It's it. it uh, so a deep listening is no longer something about your ears. It's deeper. It's 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 a it's a, it's your heart. Yeah. Uh, I, if anyone wants to speak to that, I'd like to hear some more. But it's 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 trying to also. It's a decentering ex, uh, exercise, I think, to to this to to figure out what it is that's being asked of you actually in that listening, right? So to be to be to be touched by something rather than just to process cognitively something. Mm -hmm. That's my best like take that. take on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I used to go with Carol Smith, the famous yes. remember Carol yep. yeah. a lot. And that was very yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I can't speak much to the Dominicans, but uh <laughs> I think they've and I've heard they've scaled back the retreat center a little yeah, bit. It's a little harder to but they yeah, these we used, I did a retreat there once uh, when I was early in my career here. We our department went there for a day. It was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, one of the faculty emeriti is a Benedictine Popley. So, Are you, is it Dave Deephouse? Yeah. I heard that recently. I really need to talk to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Right. So, uh, not unusual for Protestants to become yeah. oblates of the Benedictine Kathleen order. Norris. Kathleen Norris. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 There's something very attractive there. And, and and I think the older you get too, the more attractive it is. So yep. um so yeah. I'm fascinated with the, the fact that in our culture we're trying to dominate, mm -hmm. dominate time. Ah. And and when you go in I've been in two different monasteries and they, they said swim in the moment. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Swim, in the, swim in the moment. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I hadn't seen that. Has, or heard that. You know, there's there's a book that uh, if you live to be 80, you have uh, something, so many weeks, 4,000 weeks, whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we we have to understand the, the, the borders yeah. are gifted by God. Yeah. And and then we don't have to say I'm going to dominate my time. Yeah, I set the clock and then I stop. I'm not going to dump it. No. Yeah. So when you walk in to some of these places, you have that. Uh, okay. You feel that, so huh? You don't have to dominate. That's fast. I love that. Swim with the moment. Swim in the moment. Yeah. Well, in the rule, one of the first things in the rule is Benedict says, "Remember, you will die." So it's the starting point, yep. right? Yep. So you you yep. right away embrace those limitations of your life, and then there's a freedom that ensues somehow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dwight, yeah. It, it's mostly outside of the scope of your talk, and it's because <laughs> I do early modern monastic colonization. Of course, the Benedictines are nowhere, right? It's mm -hmm. they're not there. It must be the stabilitas piece. But I'm I'm wondering one who's filling these German Dutch monasteries? Are they being filled by Dutch and Germans? Or are they coming from the outside? But if you're if you're embracing your embracing your place, how do you even get Benedictines in the United States? Hmm. Right. I mean, how how do you focus on where you are yet expand or spread or? Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose in yeah, certain yeah. cir cir circumstances are going to bring people around the world over time, no matter what, right? And then I suppose people will be called to that order, that way of life. So it doesn't mean, I mean, I'll say it all still be in Italy in the first yeah. Benedictine Monastery. Uh, Franz, you have a comment? Well, maybe I can speak to that. Yeah, please. Um, the, the Bene you spoke about the Benedictine, Benedictine order, but the Benedictine order doesn't really exist until the 14th century when it gets organized as an order. It's predominantly a rule. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. where people live together mm -hmm. in monastic life, mm -hmm. they yeah. adopt the rule mm -hmm. rather than and, and every monastery is an is a self-sufficient community. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah. it's it's not there's no yeah. unlike the Dominicans, right. there's no hierarchical structure mm -hmm. or you know, internal visitation. Uh, or, yeah. Uh, Thanks for yeah, this is good to have a, a, a late medievalist in the audience to remind us that you're right though, yeah. And then I'm often oh, what? <laughs> high medievalist. Yeah. Yeah. There are, apparently are even Lutheran Benedictine orders. Well, there's so, an Episcopal Benedictine monastery in yeah. um, in three Rivers. Rivers. Uh, okay. it's the closest. Yeah. St. Gregory's. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Franz. That's yeah, that's great. That's a great answer to your question. Any other question? Last chance. Lu uh, Lyle, go ahead. Lyle, yeah. Um, one of the things I've always appreciated about the Benedictine rule is that even though it's highly structured and organized and everything. Mm -hmm. It's very sympathetic to human weakness mm -hmm. and human foibles. Mm -hmm. For just one example, and there are many, I mean, it says now when chapel service begins, sing that first psalm very slowly to allow the stragglers to get there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there, there are many examples of that yeah. uh, throughout the room. And I just wonder, how does that fit into this larger picture of time and when you start, you start. When you stop, you stop. Oh man! I mean, does that, does that yeah. have a place in this picture that these that you've developed today? Oh, I mean, when, when your 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 comment makes me reminds. Well, I think there's a. I don't know if I can answer how I'm going to answer that. They there, he has a definite um, recognition of human reality, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's this paradox of, of order and flexibility. You yeah. see that. And a great example is it, there's like, it goes on for like 10 chapters of how to organize the Psalms because you have to sing all the Psalms every week. Every week, all the Psalms must be sung, right? Mm -hmm. And he gives this elaborate system of, you know, start with Psalm 4 and then this and this. And it's, it's like you need an, an algorithm just to follow the logic of it all. And then after he gets done with all that, he says... Um, but if you can figure out a different way to do it, go for it. Basically, <laughs> the main thing is get all 150 psalms sung every week. So, yeah, I, I, I maybe that's just another anecdote to underline that <laughs> paradox of structure and yet flexibility. So it's not an immutable structure; it is yeah. flexible structure. I mean, that's the genius of the rule. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks for that. Excellent. Please join me in thanking our speaker. <laughs>